Get ready for a whole new experience at this year's Festival of Homiletics in person and online, May 16th to 20th. Join us in Denver, Colorado, or online from wherever you are. This year's theme is After the Storm, Preaching and Trauma. And it will feature Otis Moss III, Nadia Boltz Weber, Robert Wright, and Raphael Warnock. This year, the festival will draw up to 1,200 colleagues in person and thousands more online for preaching, worship, and dialogue to help you develop a hands-on way to engage trauma in your own ministry context. Other speakers include William Barber II, Anna Carter Florence, Lauren Winner, Emily and Amelia Nagoski, and many more. Make plans for this incredible learning experience with top teachers. Join us in Denver or online. Go to www.festivalofhomiletics.com for registration and details. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. The readings for the fifth Sunday in Lent, which will be April 3rd, 2022, Our first reading is Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 through 21. The psalm is the 126th. The second reading is Philippians chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. And our gospel is John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. And uh, this week, um, for the next uh, few weeks, we will be the three of us as um, Rolf Jacobson is taking on administrative responsibilities and I've laid them down. And uh, so we will miss hearing his voice and look forward to his return shortly. We all get to talk more now. I know. We gotta Thank fill you. The time slot. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah, so we've got this anointing of Jesus for the, this fifth Sunday in Lent and have moved, of course, from Luke into John. And I mean, one of the things that we want to think about, particularly with this passage, but also where it's located, uh, it, it, a couple things. One is uh, that how, how different this anointing is. Uh, compared to the synoptic gospels. I don't know how often we think about that, but the fact that uh, the anointing by Jesus and John is by a friend, uh, by a dear friend and an unknown person in the synoptic gospels, unknown woman in the synoptic gospels. And and here, uh, this anointing by Mary uh, and, and with whom he is very close and along with Martha being there and Lazarus. And so there's already a, a kind of intimacy here that uh, that I would want to point out in this passage. I mean, there's the the abundant love, that's certainly a direction you can go, the abundance of perfume, the, and that's a, definitely a, an allusion back to Cana and the abundance of, of Jesus' ministry that now Mary is emulating in her own abundant uh, expression of abundant love for Jesus. But uh, But the intimacy here and the way in which that, and then, then to go back to its location in in uh, the fifth Sunday in Lent, then we have Palm Sunday and move into uh, Holy Week, is uh, is to kind of sit in that intimacy or that that poignancy and that relationship that this is the experience that Jesus has uh, immediate at least in John immediately before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So the the anointing. The, uh, the entry in Jerusalem, his last final public speech in John, and then the events of the hour. And so and I've talked about this before, but the fact that he takes that love and he takes that relationship, uh, he takes that expression of love and that intimacy, all of that he takes with him into what's next, uh, into that entry into Jerusalem. And then, of course, uh, into the events of the hour and the events of the hour with, uh, with the farewell discourse and John are, are all about Jesus saying goodbye and, uh, the farewell discourse, but not only that, but it's the betrayal of Judas in that moment, uh, of Judas in chapter 13, 
leaves the leaves the room and the the foreshadowing of Peter's denial. And so there's a really, I think, poignant contrast, right, of her act of discipleship and closeness and relationship that then those the relationships that Jesus has had uh, with his disciples are really going to be stretched and challenged and even broken only, you know, one, not even a chapter later. So much uh, you've uh, brought in, we've woven together a lot of things here, Caroline, and there's so much in this passage. I um, acknowledge uh, for many of us uh, so much, many deaths uh, that have happened. And um, one of the things that struck out for me as I was reading this one um, is uh, the idea of the aroma that would have filled the room from the fragrance. And um, there's that moment that happens when you enter the home of uh, someone who um, has died the first time. And um, you are, uh, can I use the word, assaulted by the familiar. And those are fragrances. Those are items that you would see around. And um, a lot of memories are associated with smell. And um, I, I think there, um, if I were preaching this this uh, year, I would find a way to linger in the sensory uh, memories that are arisen by fragrance and what happens when something becomes a stark reality after the fact. So this happens before all of the, you know, the betrayal, before the, the crucifixion, um, even before what we're leading up to in terms of the resurrection, but to have a fragrance, to have an aroma that will just be a constant reminder of the way things were as we enter into a new reality. And, and just playing with that kind of, um, of a sensory, um, uh, assault, I think was the word that I used before, uh, just challenge folks to maybe linger in that as they're prep preparing. Yeah, I like how you both have spoken well about what Jesus himself brings into Holy Week and brings into his death and the sense of connection and intimacy and then the sensory aspect of this. I, I also would maybe offer a third way in, and none of these are you know, necessarily better than the other, just ways in which a really evocative text brings out different approaches. I would think about just this, all the odd juxtapositions in this passage and how that probably is part of just the tradition itself and the memory that, you know, that, that Lazarus is now known as Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. That's a nickname that's not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, but he's there. And so you've got somebody who used to be dead <laughs> and is now living here. You've got somebody who we think is alive, but now is talking as if he himself is a corpse uh, and is about to die and is about to rise again. And so all of these things that are supposed to be um, unalterable, inalterable, whatever, uh, around death are suddenly just broken open. And, and so the living are really dead, the dead are really living and and that, that line between life and death is broken open. In the midst of it is this feast of the senses. There's an act of what I think is, is great love. There's not much description about what Mary does, but she does wipe his feet with her hair, which is, a I think, a dramatic um, statement of intimacy of, of some kind. Um, but you also, have, you also have Judas's greed and maybe kind of pettiness or... Uh, duplicity that's in this it's just there's so much in the room uh, in this moment and it seems to all belong there it seems to all be in some ways kind of appropriate there I mean Judas of course is called out by the narrator but it's a great way to think about where well, was my point finally it's a great way to think about a Christian approach to death I think that I'm not sure death is ever beautiful um, but there are times when death has a particular a mystery to it or a kind of a loving sense of it right there's no I don't think any two deaths are exactly the same but everybody listening knows the difference but a way of talking about how Christians are standing at that threshold and saying it's about more than what you can see right now it's about more than what you can imagine it's maybe about more than what even science tells you or what um, certain aspects of memory or tradition tell you that there's something still going on there's something that lingers 
there's something not final in this moment. And to, to invite people into that, um, even to think about doing a funeral type sermon, even though it's not a funeral uh, at, at this time, and, and just kind of say, what does it mean that we, and how, what a foolish thing it must sound like to some people that we proclaim the resurrection um, with a dead body in the room. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I, that just seems perfectly appropriate for Lent, but also perfectly appropriate for just deeper instruction about how weird Christian faith really is. Mm -hmm. The power, I think, of what you're describing, Matt, to do that when it is not a funeral service. Um, what, what gives us the hope in the moment of horror is having been given that hope when things were kind of hopping along. And uh, to be able to, um, to have the lesson placed before us um, when we're not trying to get through grieving, when we're not trying to get through loss, when we're not trying to get through whatever that, that horror is. And the reality is the moment we're living in is so filled with all those horrors anyway. You know, so everything that you just named in that room is also the different experiences that we're having in this moment, uh, politically, socially, culturally, ecclesially, uh, personally, they're all bumping up beside one another. And to be able to, to have them play off one another, I think is a, a very powerful way to go at um, both uh, exegetically what's happening here, but also how that speaks into the moment we're living today. Do you think this does this um does this scene propel Jesus anywhere? You know what I mean when he talks about his time having come and things like that. Like, is this a nudge or is this just a reflection of what's already what has already gained so much steam in the narrative, as John tells it? Well, that's an I mean he's not quite there, but he's really close to declaring it's time. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I uh, you know, we don't obviously have a lot of access to Jesus' psyche and what, you know, what what is then uh, what is then next for him. But we can't help thinking that narratively, obviously, because of the chronology of when this happens, and then you have the triumphal entry. But if you think about the fact that uh, th that the impetus, of course, for Jesus' arrest is the raising of Lazarus, that, you know, to what extent Jesus arrives at the home of Mary and Martha and Bethany and knows, again, I'm putting a lot on Jesus' psyche here, but knows that there's no way in a million years he's going to get away with <laughs> raising somebody, you know, back from the dead, uh, that, that, and because that then ends up being, right, that, that, that knowledge of, of the, you know, that this is in verse 57. Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who knew where Jesus was should let them know so that they might arrest him. And, and then uh, of course, immediately after the anointing is the plot to kill Lazarus. And so the, the, you know, this, the whole, the whole anointing scene is being framed by eliminating <laughs> that which brings, you know, that, that which represents life uh, and abundant life. And so I, I, uh, I think you can certainly uh, think that, right. That that's, that's what's going on here. And as I alluded to earlier, and I, I like your thought too, Matt, about what is it that you carry forward uh, in that, how is it that, and I've talked about this before, but how is it that Jesus knowing that is carrying this with him? I mean, and not only, not only is it a, you know, a nudge to what's happening, maybe, you know, to th that once he enters into Jerusalem, then, you know, the events of the hour are going to come, but it's not, but it's not just the farewell discourse. It's just, you know, to what extent he carries this with him to the trial and the cross and the, um, and, 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 and his death on the cross. So there's, um, yeah. And, and, and the way in which, uh, you know, Judas will come back in the farewell discourse and, 
uh, reject that, reject that love again, you know, that he rejects the love of that Mary shows and then rejects the love of Jesus. So, um, yeah, I think there's something there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to play with words when you talk about that rejection. Um, uh, the last uh, verse eight, um, you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. Uh, somehow or another, when I read this, and I wasn't going to say it except for you, you, you bring it up, uh, or you, you brought it back to my mind as you were, were talking about Judas's uh, betrayal. In this idea of not Jesus not being physically present, um, but in this idea uh, of we, the poor are always with them and we, with us, and we ignore them. We ignore their needs. We live in a way that makes sure that they continue to exist. So they are always with us. Um, there's a similar kind of Jesus is with us. So we confess. And yet we live as if he is not always with us. And this idea that uh, reminds us that Jesus is there for Judas. And yet Judas lives as if, acts as if. Jesus is not. And what if rather than that literal, you do not always have me with, uh, with me, um, it's that uh, acknowledgement of Jesus presence, which flips on the poor you have with you, which we don't acknowledge. And Jesus, we have with us mm -hmm. and we don't acknowledge. I, 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 I thought about that. I didn't push it further, but you're bringing up that uh, response of Judas. Just, you know, folks have time to play with that. Mm -hmm. I get something out of it. Yeah, if anybody wants to give an extravagant gift to Jesus, you can do that by giving an extravagant gift to those who suffer from poverty, right? I mean, I think there's that kind of connection. I'm probably cheating and bringing in a little Matthew 25 there around the edges. Mm -hmm. Some of the, the Johannine purists in the room might reject, but... Uh, yeah. I'm not going to be the one to give you a problem on that. <laughs> <laughs> Should we look to Isaiah? Isaiah? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is also great for, this is a great end of Lent text, this idea of, remember all that stuff I did for you? God says, it was all real, it was all really important, but forget all that stuff. I'm doing new stuff. You know what I mean? Not that the old doesn't matter, but just because, you know, I think I've, I've never really sat down and tried to verify this, but I'm pretty sure the Exodus motif is probably the most commonly re, remixed motif in the entire Bible in terms of deliverance through the waters. And so here it is, right? This is the big event. This is the foundational event in terms of God revealing who God is and what God cares about and the experience of the Hebrew people. And then verse 18, don't remember the former things, <laughs> consider the things of old, because um, I'm about to do a new thing. And so this idea, it's the same old thing, of course, which is what's fascinating. I'm still going to provide a way through um, a location of death. Instead of now the waters, it's going to be the desert. So it's still the same old kind of act by the same God who keeps like keeps enjoying doing the same types of deliverances but i just love the way it plays with that memory mm. and you know like it's, don't subsist just on memory alone you know still have expectations for the next deliverance the next thing that god is going to do mm -hmm. it's, oh, and, uh, old, it's, it's an old book now uh probably about uh 25 years now but uh, ricky watts uh, wrote a book, uh, and it goes to Mark, not to John. It's um, Isaiah's New Exodus in Mark. Um, but in it, he, before he gets to doing a reading of Mark, which is where his work is going, he says, you have to understand Isaiah to understand Mark. And in order to understand Isaiah, you have to understand Exodus. And his work is actually demonstrating exactly where you began on that. And that is that the Exodus narrative is so uh, central to the imagination of the Jewish, uh, to the Jewish imagination that um, you fully understand Isaiah only when you see it 
as an echo of what they have experienced in the Exodus. And uh, uh, I love what you just did uh, to carry that through for us, that the same God who did this is doing a new thing, but it should be so familiar to us. No matter what circumstance you're in, no matter what wilderness you're, you're wandering, no matter what dry way you are trying to negotiate, no matter what light has been extinguished, no matter what, what, how bad things are, no matter how deep the pit, God is a rescuing God. God shows up, it shows out. God is going to make a way. And you don't have to say, oh, if only this was what had happened last time, I know God can handle it. No, it doesn't matter what it is. God handled that and God can handle this. So we remember the former things, but we look for God to show up in brand new ways and can expect that that will be very good. Yeah, and I, I think also, so that's a way to, it, it's a way to cast uh, it, when we look, look at the next two weeks, you know, Palm Sunday and then Holy Week, it's a way to cast, uh, you know, uh, that in anticipation of newness through, but even, but even through that wilderness. But I think it also, the Isaiah text, the pairing, and particularly as you noticed, Matt, the location of being the last Sunday of Lent, I think it also invites sort of um, an imaginary kind of uh, uh, imaginary, it's an imaginary invitation to say, uh, how, how, what kind of language do you give the next, this next part of the church season that we're, we're that we're walking into with Palm Sunday and Holy Week? Like, how do you describe that? Is it this, uh, is it, does it feel like a sea? Does it feel like mighty waters? Does it feel like, you know, this wilderness or does it feel like a desert or even to go back to our commentaries, our, our, our comments around Jesus anticipation of his own death. Uh, and you think about people who are anticipating their deaths. What does it feel like? What is it? Uh, how are they describing it? Um, and maybe just sit there a little bit too. Uh, I think it just it, it it invites that kind of metaphorizing of of that experience that uh, that is at the end of the day maybe undescribable. Maybe that's part of the point too. So that might be another direction you go as well. Uh, believing in, I mean, it becomes a, the the thing becomes an entire metaphor, as we were saying, of of what's on the other side of death is resurrection, uh, but. And that newness, that newness is both old and new, uh, but it, I think it also invites that kind of sense of, um, yeah, how, how, how are we going to give, how are we going to articulate what that experience is like? Um, might be another direction. It's going to, um, it's going to expand from, the, in terms of former things, uh, if we take that literally in terms of what God has done for Israel becomes the new thing that what God has always been doing with Israel is for the sake of all the world. And for those who have remembered the former things of God doing this for one people, they will have forgotten that and will see this as a new thing. Um, that God is doing this for all creation, when in actuality, this is what God has always been doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I really do think we get some similar themes in 120, uh, Psalm 126. Is that, can we? Um, yes, go there? absolutely I mean, perfect. Yeah, we're, we're really getting the similar kind of language. The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we rejoiced, uh, restore our fortunes, O Lord. And so it really does, It, it the Psalm gives, as I said, the psalm is really give language to one of the, some of the things that we're already talking about um, in terms of of to what do we look forward um, and and also stating that trust in God and that that's a that we're relying on it we're relying on God's character <laughs> significantly you know and what God who God is and what God does and 
maybe that's also all you can do when you're facing that as well, that you can't articulate that you can't, you can't, you don't know what to expect or you can't yourself articulate that, but you can trust in God's character uh, and who God has been for you. That might be too. I, I love that. And the, 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 uh, um, not being able to articulate um, is the greatness of it. You know, the laughter, the, the, the filling with uh, joy, um, uh, uh, the shouts of joy, the, the great goodness of it um, is, is just as, um, uh, we're just as limited in being able to express that as we are to express the groanings and the longings and the, and the, the, the needs and the wants and the expectations. Uh, those two are, are set side by side. Again, in this text, the way it's, uh, we've already articulated it. Uh, uh, Matt, as you began us out when we talked about John, um, the, 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 all the things that are in the room. In this, in this text, they are all um, unarticulatable. <laughs> Is that a word I can spell? Sure, we know what you mean. <laughs> it's um, you know if Ross going to be away for a while, I'm glad that he left us with this psalm to get, do first because it's relatively easy, um, <laughs> at least easy to set into a context. Right, talking about return and. But it, it is full of all those sensory experiences, you know, the, the idea of, of seeing water in a, in a dry riverbed through the desert and experiencing that and the joy of a harvest and caring in sheaves and all of that, this idea of, 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 of great celebration. One of the, one of the, I know a few things about a few Psalms here and there, and, and this one is that most Christian translations and, and Clint McCann talks about this in his commentary, most Christian translations in those first three verses, use the past tense, but it's also possible to translate that future. And um, I know that the, the Tanakh translation, the one that uh, the Jewish Publication Society puts out, translates that into the future. And so it's not entirely split among Christians and Jews, but certainly in some major translations, this idea of when the Lord, when the Lord restores the futures, we will be like those who dream, then our mouths will be filled with laughter. Which, you know, on the one hand is a historical question about when the psalm is written, what, what perspective it takes on return from exile. But I like the ambiguity there that it's also, how do you anticipate what God will do in the next deliverance? How are you going to respond when God does something amazing in your midst? Mm -hmm. And so there's a way in which it's a pledge to celebrate. It's not just a memory of celebrations past, but it's a commitment. And that's also, I think, fully appropriate as Lent comes to an end and, and everybody's taking stock of what have we been doing for five weeks and what was the purpose of this again yeah and is there going to be some when we get more nicer, nicer flowers back in the sanctuary I mean what is it that we're working towards so it's not just a kind of seasonal march into springtime yeah and and the commentary points that out the paragraph on that's memory and hope uh that that uh, we simultaneously celebrate with joy that the Lord has done great things and we fervently play restore our hope, our fortunes, O oh Lord. And so there is a, that taking that the, that the preacher takes seriously the locate that the fifth Sunday in Lent, that is a combination of memory and hope uh, and, and, and maybe inviting people into that space of where they have felt that before and what is the function of both and how do they work together in our lives, I think could be really homiletically rich. If we do that uh, in Philippians, Paul does it for us um, in looking back to all that is his resume and yet um, not up, up well, I'm wanting to get to the line, but I press on. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that because uh, Christ Jesus has made me, made him his own, um, it's, it's uh, this sense of uh, whatever the former things were or are, it's the character of God, it's the gift of God, it's the fulfilled promise of God that keeps me pressing on uh, toward the prize that is in Christ Jesus. And that, in, in many ways, we've said about each of the texts today. Uh, so however um, 
one comes at uh, this fifth Sunday in Lent, it seems that the texts are inviting us to be able to, in whatever circumstances we find ourselves, to press on in hope because the character of God is trustworthy. And how that how that trustworthiness builds up in endurance uh, in in a person. It's just not necessarily proving your your worth, proving your salvation, but this is a way in which uh, this newness creates a different attitude toward living entirely. So even you know, the, and and one has to be careful to avoid slipping into a kind of a casual anti-Semitism with a passage like this that you know Paul somehow got rid of a. A bad religious imagination and took on a um, the right one, but but when Paul talks about having endured the loss of all things, I don't think here he's talking about about persecution and opposition. I think he's talking about having stepped into really a new understanding of who he is, what his own ego is, what his self is, and that gets reconstituted now as as Christ, as Christ Himself. And then by definition, as unity with all other people who he meets or he's connected to now in Christ. And so it's, a, it's not just a call to personal self-improvement, but it's a call to, I think, recognizing one's new identity yeah. that is irreducibly corporate and connected. And Which might even uh, tie into John, but go ahead. Well, and, and connected to Jesus. And so I, I was going to point the, what you were just saying, Matt, I mean, the line that really does the verse that really does uh, emphasize that, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. And uh, that's, that's a, a beautiful rhetorical moment there in Philippians that we make, we, we press on making what, what is our own because Jesus has made us his own and that the identity, our identity is connected to, uh, to that identity. And then, um, and then, as you said, also corporate. So it, it would be, it would be a, uh, it would be a great line to end the sermon, wouldn't it? Um, that promise of who we are is wrapped up in who Jesus is. <laughs>